This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recording and you will have to answer questions as you listen. The test is divided into four sections. All the recordings will be played once only. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now, turn to section 1. Section 1. You are going to listen to a conversation between a student and a clerk at Barclays Bank. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello, I'd like to open a bank account. What type of account do you want? Well, I'm going to London University in October and I need somewhere to deposit my grant. Well, who pays your grant? The British Council. You could open a student account with us. What does it offer? Well, normally, you'd receive a checkbook, which saves you having to carry a lot of cash around. You would also get a Connect card which you can use 24 hours a day in our machine at any branches and in the machines of Lloyd's, Bank of Scotland and the Royal Bank of Scotland. You can obtain up to 200 per day and night by using your Connect card. The Connect card can also be used for a cheque guarantee card. Sorry, what's that? A cheque guarantee card enables you to cash up to £50 without prior arrangement at most banks in the UK and you'll need it to pay shops, garages, hotels, etc., because it guarantees that your cheque will be honoured. I see. Will I get interest on the money in my student account? Yes, you will get a small amount of interest. That is, up to 500, the interest is 4%. 500 or more, the interest goes up to 6%. Now you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. What other advantages do student accounts have? Well, we offer a 250 overdraft limit at our lower rate of interest. Can I open a student account then? What do I need? You need a letter to prove that you are getting a grant from some authority and identification such as your passport. Then, you need to fill in some simple forms about your course and the duration of your stay in the UK, your address and your signature. OK, I'll bring them in later. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Goodbye. You have some time to check your answers from 1 to 10 of section 1. Now, turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer to a group of civil engineering students on the reed bed system for sewage treatment. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about what is now called the Reed Bed Sewage Treatment System.
This system uses naturally occurring reeds to treat domestic and industrial waste. It's an environmentally friendly alternative to normal systems. You all know what reeds are like, don't you? Those tall plants with hollow stems that grow in wet places, like marshes, for example. Here's how the system works. First of all, an artificial marsh is created. To do this, holes are dug about one metre deep and usually rectangular in shape. They are then lined with clay or plastic and the liner is covered with gravel. After that, a system of tubing is laid with holes in it and more gravel is added to cover that. Finally, reeds are planted in the bed. The sewage is brought to settling tanks. From there, it is distributed to the roots of the reeds through the tubing. Note that the waste material enters the beds underground and remains underground. The reeds conduct oxygen very efficiently through their stems to the roots system. Here, bacteria work to reduce the waste material to basic elements. What comes out of the artificial marsh is water that has been cleaned through a natural process. The purified water leaves the reed bed through a simple outflow pipe. The water that comes out has to be tested. Sometimes it's held in a pond until it evaporates or soaks into the ground. Sometimes, after testing, the water is discharged directly into streams and rivers. Before the talk continues, with questions from the students, and to look at questions 15 to 20. The reed bed system originated in Germany in the 1970s and installations have been built in a number of countries throughout the world. To give you an idea of the size and appearance of a reed bed installation, an area of 3 by 5 metres approximately would be adequate for a single house. It would look like a pond overgrown with reeds. There are cities with 150,000 people in Germany whose entire sewage treatment requirements are served by reed bed installations which extend for 10 to 20 hectares. There are two wonderful environmental advantages. First of all, reed bed systems are natural composters. As time passes, high grade soil builds up in the beds. The soil can be removed and used for agricultural purposes. Soil produced from waste containing heavy metals would of course have to be tested and the toxic material removed by chemical processes. An additional advantage is that the reed bed can function exactly as a marsh providing a healthy natural home or habitat for waterfowl and other birds, insects, reptiles and mammals. But there are practical advantages to a reed bed system over existing sewage treatment plants as well. At all levels, the cost is lower than for normal systems. Labour costs are a fraction of the costs of a conventional system. Typically, a large-scale reed bed installation will cost 10% less than a mechanical system. They require little maintenance, and unlike mechanical systems, the efficiency of reed beds increases over time. But before we go any further, you must have some questions. Maybe this sounds too good to be true. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. If these systems have so many benefits, why aren't they more popular? Why don't we see them everywhere? As I said, the technology is now almost 40 years old. Demonstration projects of all types have been built and monitored and are slowly convincing regulators of the advantages of the system. But you have to understand that regulating authorities are by nature conservative and resist change. Typically, there's a lot of opposition to these systems by manufacturers and by everyone involved in maintaining the conventional systems. Reed bed systems require fewer staff to operate, so there would be a decline in the workforce. 
Therefore, unions would resist the change as well. What happens to reed beds in winter? Does the efficiency decrease? The above ground part of the plants die back in cold weather, but the roots remain alive and active, and the system continues to work just as effectively in winter. As soon as the weather warms up, new reeds appear and grow quickly. Is there a problem with mosquitoes in these ponds? Well, they're not exactly ponds with standing water. The beds look more like a field covered with long grass. The soil is moist, but not like a swamp, so there would be no more mosquitoes than in any other field. Remember, the effluent enters the beds underground and remains underground. Okay, let's get into some of the technical details now, and I'll answer questions as they come up. You have some time to check your answers from 11 to 20 of section 2. Now, turn to Section 3. Section 3. You are going to hear a talk about the services in Ealing College. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Welcome to Ealing College of Higher Education. Today I'll talk about student services at the college. All student services are to be found in the North Building. Social life and some of the welfare services are run by the student union of which all students are automatically members. After enrolment, take your receipt to the student union and they will give you your student card. Your student card also entitles you to membership in the Student and Staff Club. The Student Union will give you a handbook which gives more details on all the services offered plus more information on the health service, accommodation and so on. Let's talk about medical services first. ECHE has a student health centre. The centre is open from 9.30 to 8.45, Monday to Thursday, and from 9.30 to 5 on Fridays, during term time. The college doctor, Dr B. Kierens, holds a surgery in the medical centre four days a week, Monday and Tuesday mornings, Thursday afternoons, and either Wednesday or Friday afternoons. The nurse will tell you which one on any particular week. Appointments for these are made through the nurses and are usually for the following day. Outside of these times, Dr. Kearns can be found at her surgery, which is located at number 2 Ascot Avenue, W5, very close to college. During your stay in England, you must register with a local doctor, and if you live in the London borough of Ealing, you can register with Dr Cairns. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Last time I talked about the student services in the college. 
Today I'd like to talk about the counselling services. The college counselling service is located in the North Building. The counsellors are Ms Penny Rawson and Ms Anne David. I have asked Ms Rawson to join us today to discuss their role. Ms Rawson. Thank you. Both Anne and I are full-time counsellors. Students either come to us on their own or are referred to us by a tutor. We see students individually, run group therapy sessions and courses of sessions as we think necessary. We are here to help with any problems, no matter how great or small, such as homesickness, relationship difficulties, death and separation, sexual problems, undue stress due to work and so on. You will not be the first to be homesick, find college life stressful or decisions problematic, so please don't hesitate to come and have a chat if there's anything bothering you. This is a confidential service, but we are willing to arrange with your course directors, your tutors, student union officers, career department or doctors. We can also put you in touch with outside counselling services. As a part of the university, all counselling is free of charge for full-time students. I know some of you may feel that seeing a counsellor has a stigma attached to it, but let me assure you, even the best balanced individuals encounter situations where they need someone to talk with, so please don't hesitate. You're welcome to make use of this service. We hope you will enjoy your studies at the university. Thank you. You have some time to check your answers from 21 to 30 of Section 3. Time to look at questions 31 to 35. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the Kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as Kiwis. Now, while Kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the Kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The Kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one-third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose, because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000 and our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Now you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40.
And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Programme in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this programme. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we're hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the kiwi's natural habitat and we collect kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part, because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85%. However, it's not time to celebrate Kiwi survival just yet. About 95% of Kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. You have some time to check your answers from 31 to 40 of Section 4. In the IELTS exam, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.